Hello, my name's Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about post-intensive care syndrome. Previously, we've talked about disorders of consciousness in the ITU. We've talked about intensive care uh, unit survivorship, prognosis, particularly after cardiac arrest, deconditioning, and the spectrum of intensive care associated weakness with critical uh, illness, neuromyopathy, myopathy, and, and polyneuropathy. But actually, when we explore this a little bit more, there's a much broader range of issues that affect survivors, whether it's physical, cognitive, emotional, mental health, social or work. And we also have to appreciate the effects on family and close support network as well. And this video will very much dovetail with another video I'm going to record from a survivor. So please do watch that one, too. A very important programme to appreciate that is going on in the NHS at the moment is the Get It Right First Time programme. And it's looking to find variation in the provision of services, the causes behind them and how they can be improved. And it's looking at a variety of different services. For these purposes, we're going to look at the adult critical care one. Now, within that report, there's lots of different aspects of critical care that's being looked at. We're going to focus on the rehabilitation. They have highlighted that although there is lots of data that is recorded by the NHS on different aspects of healthcare, in terms of the outcomes of what happens to patients after intensive care, um, it's actually quite limited. So we do know what happens to readmission rates and to mortality rates after people are dis discharged from hospital. So in the first 90 days, um, readmission rates are about 25% and there's an increased mortality rate of about 22%. And those rates will also have variability depending on which hospital someone's gone to. So there's a fair bit of variability in the system. And that's also reflective of variation in the provision of uh, the types of staff um, to the units, services, uh, working practices. Do they do seven day weeks and so on? Are there follow up clinics as well? In terms of the rehab workforce, um, again, there's only limited data, but what they have managed to glean from the uh, faculty of the intensive care uh, medical workforce data bank is that 86% um, of units will have access to a dietitian. So although that's quite quite good, uh, we would like that to be 100%, but only 30% have access to a speech and language therapist, uh, which clearly isn't tremendous. Um, occupational therapy, only 14%, and they make the point that occupational therapy can help with uh, sedation holding and um, breaks from having uh, long-term sedation. Um, and only 17% of units have got psychological support um, available. Um, and even then, it tends to be quite limited, only one psychologist at a time. And in terms of the physical rehab thereafter, um, there are reports that um, that rehab uh, was uh, only 30% of units reported physiotherapy contributing to follow-up clinics uh, and 19% uh, reporting the provision of outpatient-based services when discharged. So clearly, those are things which are important to improve upon. In terms of the physical aspects of post-intensive care syndrome, we've already discussed uh, the neuromyopathy spectrum, but fundamentally those all increase time on the ventilator and there are multiple adverse outcomes which can occur as a result. And the reality is in terms of the physical side of it, it's far beyond uh, just the neuromyopathies can affect literally anything, usually on a temporary basis. But if we just start to try and explore some of this, uh, you know, patient's vision um, can be affected. They can have dry, sore eyes for some time afterwards, particularly if eyes have not been uh, you know, closed uh, whilst um, they have been semi-conscious or unconscious. Uh, hearing can be an issue, uh, whether it's a direct result of medications. Often for sepsis, we need to use certain types of antibiotics which can affect hearing. Um, sometimes the loud noises of the department can affect the hearing. Sometimes um, hypotension, low blood pressures, um, particularly for those who've had cardiac arrests, can affect hearing because the vestibular nerve, the nerve which looks after hearing, is very susceptible to low blood pressure. Uh, patients can have their taste, smell and appetite reduced um, and that can be affected by um, the flow of oxygen in the nasal cannula, face masks and so on. Speech and voice uh, changes can be affected um, by having endotracheal tubes um, which um, can can actually sit on the vocal cords or affect the uh, the nerves to the vocal cords. Um, so those can be issues. Swallowing can be impaired uh, in terms of the skin 
uh, lots of patients can have itch dryness there can be uh, wound and pressure sore related issues it can be hair loss as well urinary issues aren't often talked about uh, but that can be an issue sexual dysfunction too remember lots of patients have got catheters in for quite a while and of course there's organ dysfunction as well in terms of whichever organs have failed many patients have come into an ITU with multi-organ failure so if their their heart's gone into heart failure or their lungs have got chronic lung issues um or the kidneys aren't working properly, um, those can all have long-term um, issues too. In terms of cognition, we know that cognition uh, scores can be impaired for memory, executive function, language, attention, and visual spatial skills. Um, the risk factors for this um, are understood, uh, include um, delirium in the ITU, strongly associated with that, if there was any pre-existing dementia going in, and of course, length of stay as well. Now, fortunately, uh, cognitive scores do tend to improve with time, but they can remain lower than expected. And in fact, for the three years following an ITU uh, stay, there is an increased risk in having a new diagnosis of dementia. So um, that can be an issue too. In terms of emotional and mental health, depression is very common, about a third of patients. Anxiety, 70% of patients will be affected by this. PTSD uh, can affect about 30% of patients and can even persist at a year down the line for about 10%. Fortunately, most of these things do uh, reduce and ameliorate with time though. And of course, some patients can be left with long-lasting guilt. Why do they sort of survive? Why did others not? Risk factors for these do include pre-existing uh, mental health issues, low educational uh, levels, uh, women tend to be more affected, and those who are involved in substance abuse, including alcohol. Um, in terms of interventions, of course, there's a raft of psychological interventions which can be deployed, uh, but there is evidence for the use of diaries for in reducing the risk of developing PTSD. And the idea behind that is it can help to fill in the gaps of patients and help make sense of their experiences. So afterwards, um, you know, the family and loved ones can say to them, actually, on this day, the reason you uh, felt that this was going on was actually because of X, Y, Z going on um, around you. And that can help uh, patients and be beneficial. We can't just think about patients. We've got to think about the families as well, the, the network around the patients. They're also quite equally likely to be affected by emotional um, and mental health issues, whether it's depression, anxiety, PTSD, all very common. Um, something called complicated grief, when painful emotions are not resolved with time. They can be um, affected by burden and overload, by, by everything that's going around them. Often intensive care admissions are very acute, very sudden events. Uh, it can be very, very difficult. Although you know, generally these do things these do tend to ameliorate with time these are all issues which should be addressed and, and one needs to to think about these apart from the patient directly um, there are also more longer term issues which can affect families and and and, and loved ones ongoing care needs uh, which can be you know quite significant in some cases there can be altered relationships altered dynamics within the family units uh, physical intimacies we've talked about can be affected social networks can really uh, be be shrunk in particularly for those who have to care uh, for for those uh, who are left with significant um, weakness, uh, work and finance are also issues which need to be considered. The mechanisms behind all of this are very complex, multifactorial, and actually, in all honesty, difficult to isolate, but it's going to be a combination of what things were like at baseline for the patient and their family and network around them, whatever's happened in the intensive care unit, whatever brought them in there, whatever complications have occurred, and whatever support and recovery is provided. So. Although we can't affect what happens at baseline, we can try and optimise things within the ITU environment and obviously try and optimise things in terms of support and recovery rehabilitation. In terms of prevention, um, communication is really key uh, to all of this. It's so important that we demonstrate our care, compassion, thoughtfulness to both the patients, to their loved ones, their carers, and to be able to communicate on a regular and effective basis really important. We have to aim to minimise or reduce sedation uh, whenever practicable, to optimise medical and pharmaceutical care so that we deal with issues in a, a timely and quick manner and make sure that we um, give patients the right medications at the right time with the minimum amount, number, amount of side effects. Pain management is very important that patients aren't left in pain. We need to think about sleep and the ITU environment, try and reduce beep, beeping sounds, lights. Uh, we have to pay attention to delirium and to its management. Of course, expert nutritional advice, 
early access to occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language therapy, all really key. Um, and then rehabilitation facilities appropriate to needs and access to psychological and any pastoral support. Diaries, as I've mentioned, are important and signposting to various organisations, uh, which can also um, help patients and their families too. I'd like to finish with this uh, final quote from the uh, GERFT programme. Mortality alone is increasingly recognised to be a poor marker of good intensive care. Instead, we should be using uh, patients, their family and MDT assessments of morbidity, return to work and late mortality to best assess the true success of our intensive care intervention. Or in other words, if we're going to be putting patients through intensive care, in order to help them recover, then we have to do everything we can to try and get them um, into an optimal uh, position that they can go on and enjoy their lives further. Thank you very much. I hope this video was useful. Please do support the channel by liking, sharing, and above all, subscribing. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. All the very best.